the message this morning on willingness to give, willingness to give, and uh, theme has been probably most of this year is salvation, sanctification, and service. And tonight will be just about, or today will be just about the same three points, and uh, will be, uh, I believe I've got salvation, separation, and service. How about that? And uh, the more you're going to understand the Word of God, uh, the more you're going to come to the conclusion that those three things are paramount in our life, and whatever causes us to doubt our salvation or stops us from uh, separating us uh, onto God and stops us from serving God, uh, those things have to be dealt with in this life, uh, or we're going to be most people miserable as Christians, uh, because you want to have complete confidence in your salvation. You want to understand the things that will stop you uh, in this Christian walk. And you know that you have a higher calling than just a nominal person on planet Earth because you're saved. And you're part of the family of God. So the willingness has to be there. It's our will. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, context is the Lord's Supper. And... Uh, You say, how apropos, a preacher asked that, said he needed so much money and he's preaching on willingness to give. <laughs> you know, there's some people that are sitting there who might think like that, might think that I would say something like that and then preach on giving money. I mean, that would be sort of neat, but it just worked out that way, amen. And it's uh, really, uh, it'll be a little different for you. Anyway, verse 23 of uh, chapter 11 says this, For I have received of the Lord. Paul saying, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So initiating the Lord's Supper, we know that it's a commandment from the Lord, and we know that because God told Paul. Correct? God delivered this message to Paul. Then Paul, in turn, willingly gave that message out. Uh, we're not robots. Uh, God allows you to have a free will. And uh, the more we understand that, I think, uh, the more we'll appreciate the mercy and grace of God. Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, you'd fill us and the hearers. And God, for those that are here, Father, dear God, you know where we are. You know who's here. Uh, you know what we need. Uh, Father, if anything gets done, uh, you're getting the credit. You're getting the glory. It's your word, Father. It's your Holy Spirit. Uh, this is the earthen vessel that you chose to use. Pray, dear God, that uh, I'm cleaned up enough to deliver it. Pray that the blood of Lord Jesus Christ cleans our minds uh, from anything that would uh, defile or take away from the Word of God. We pray, God, that we focus on what you have to say this morning and not what's going to take place afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen. Willingness as a noun is uh, free choice or consent of the will. Freedom from reluctance. Readiness of the mind to do or forbear, and also just the will, uh, used as a noun. It's that faculty of the mind by which we determine either to do or forbear an action. The faculty which is exercised in deciding among, among two or more objects which we shall embrace or pursue. So we reason with respect to the value or importance of things. That's our will. We reason with respect to the value or importance of things. In other words, you will do what you want to do. And and so many people say, well, the devil made me do it. I think it was Flip Wilson in the 70s or something. And then everybody took out, well, the devil made me do it. Yeah, uh-huh. No, you agreed with the devil to do it. That's what you did. See, our want to, our will, we have power over, correct? Just so you understand that, that's, that's what we're talking about. So, <clears throat> Paul had a free will, as do all men. Uh, their will is the deciding factor. Now, turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And after all, when you think about our bad habits, how they start, right? Normally a bad habit, we're already warned against it. Normally, I mean, you know, that's what 
made it a bad habit. And, and people have warned us, and then we did what? We disregarded warnings, and we exercised our own will to do something. And then lo and behold, that thing become better, bigger than our will, correct? And then it dictates to our will. Why? Because we surrendered our will to it. And what a lot of people don't understand is that when you got saved, you really, truly, actually have power over these things to get victory. Because the Bible says that we're not under the dominion of sin anymore. Uh, Wesley, when he wrote that song, he talked about my chains fell off. Uh, that's what he was talking about. That now he has power to serve God in this flesh. And so those bad habits can be dealt with. We can get victory over bad habits, thank God. But understand, you can't blame the devil or God for your bad habits. It's you that gave in the bad habits. So willingness to give. Over here in Acts chapter 3, and we'll read 16 verses here. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And alms is money. They wanted some money. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, look what he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and what? Praising God. I would too. I was lame. I mean, right now, I mean, if God would heal me, I'd have to praise the Lord, wouldn't I? Wouldn't have to. But I'll tell you what, if he gave me a healing, I would give him back some praise. Isn't that something? Don't we give and take like that? Oh, what if he don't heal me? Will I still give him praise? That's Christian life. See, that's, that's what we're trying to grow into. All of our problems is fighting us most of the time, right? Because the Christian viewpoint comes to us, we hear it, and we immediately repel it. Because that's the flesh. When we can understand that, we get a little bit more handle on, on our condition of how spiritual we really are. And if we don't take our temperature every now and then, we're going to deceive ourselves. Verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together out of them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, look what he said. He answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power, or what? Holiness, we had made this man to walk. Wow. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a, a murderer uh, to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith, in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. Peter delivered. What he had. He had no riches of carnal state. He only had Jesus Christ and the gifts he was given by the Holy Ghost. He and John were willing to give. They were. It's amazing a lot of times since we don't have financial means sometimes we forget what we got. 
you got the Lord. You got the Lord. A lot of times, uh, you know, we, we, we say we, we just can't get fruit from the Lord. We can't uh, lead anybody to the Lord. We haven't had an opportunity. No, we, we have opportunity. There's always opportunity to tell people about the Lord. That's something you've got that you can give. But it takes your will, doesn't it? And that means that your will's got to fight everything around you. Fight your own mind, your own flesh. It's amazing that, uh, that uh, your will has to be willing to do God's service. It's got to be willing to do it. And a lot of times we'll wait for a rush from the Holy Spirit or we'll wait for some pill to take. And, and guess what? It's not going to get done. It's not going to get done. And you can do all the experiments you want. Like, for instance, let's see. Maybe yesterday you were planning on what to eat today. Correct? Now, uh, you will that. If you're going to eat today, what you thought about yesterday would be good for today, it happened, right? Well, not yet, but it's going to happen. You got faith in that. Yeah. You got substance. You exercised your will. When you go home from church, you're going to pig out on something that you like. Yes, you are. Or go to a restaurant that you like. You're going to do something that you like. I guarantee you're going to do what you want to do. So, God tells us certain things. First thing we want to do is opposite. Now, as a preacher, I'm trying to help you. I'm not demanding you by the law to do certain things. I am telling you that this Bible is against you. And you'll hear all sorts of sermons and platitudes and everything else and self-esteem, and you'll get built up and you'll get all gooey about yourself and all this kind of stuff. But when I read this book, it's a mirror. It shows me where I'm at. When somebody preaches against certain things, if I'm if I got victory, hallelujah, I'll, I'll amen that. And the other things, I just say, oh me. Because what are you going to do, right? Something's going to come up. Why? Because we're human in this human body, trying to serve a holy, righteous God. How can you do that? How can you perform that? Only by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first, you have to understand what your will is. Even though you have a vague, uh, an idea of it, you have to understand how powerful your will is. Right? You do. And when you understand how powerful that is, and how it always goes against God, maybe something will dawn on you. Like, man, why is it so rough? Because you have things working against you on planet Earth. So what are you going to do about it? Quit? Give up? Not doing anything for the Lord? No. No, you're not. Because you want to please your Father. Why? Because He's been so good to you. He loves you. He takes care of you. He provides for you. He opens up doors for you. He closes doors for you. He takes care of your family. Listens to your prayers. Nobody on earth does that for you. So you want to serve Him who has saved you, you see. So in order to do that, we gotta, you got to have a willing heart. You have a willingness to give of yourself. And I always have to ask the question of myself and you, uh, do you have a willingness to give? That's the question. Now, the first and foremost is definitely salvation. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, God has always sent me people that have certain problems with certain areas of their life that I have experienced and that I have gotten victory from the Lord. I mean, I'm figuring this thing out. He's also sent me a lot of people like myself that was bullheaded, stubborn, and uh, knew it all at first because I know what God will do to you for that. So, some of them make it up to a certain level, some of them don't. But, I'm telling you, God works things out in our life to strengthen us, to help us. It doesn't mean I'm a know-it-all. It doesn't mean I'm perfect in a whole lot of areas, but I know some things, and God allowed me to use that in the ministry. You understand that? Uh, I can, I can, I can, uh, I, if, if I didn't believe that, I'd be out of here. Why in the world, if I can't help nobody? But not everybody takes sound advice. Not everybody thinks that uh, uh, my credentials could give sound advice. Over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
Uh, let's read the first. We're talking about willingness to give. Simple message this morning, but it can be profound if you take it to heart. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you what? You stand. That means you heard the gospel. Paul preached it, right? They heard it, and they're standing on that gospel. And what I like about this portion of Scripture, it tells you in detail what the gospel is, what the good news is. So right there in these verses, it eliminates the tongue speakers, it eliminates the charismaniacs. See, it eliminates all those that would add anything. In other words, you're saved, now you got to speak in tongues. Or, you got to speak in tongues as evidence of your salvation, you see. Or, you get the gift of prophecy, you got the gift of, uh, uh, of healing, you got the gift, you know, and they run all this stuff down without proper doctrinal authority. And everybody is bamboozled by this stuff and hooked on this stuff, and they don't understand how powerful the devil really is. So when I look at this and I see that the Apostle Paul was Jesus Christ himself taught in his resurrected body, three years in the desert, when you read uh, Paul's testimony, <coughs> he's telling this church at Corinth what they have, what they got from him, what they believe they can stand on. Then he goes on to verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. That don't mean they can lose their salvation. That means if they didn't really believe in their heart of what he told them, they're not saved. That means they, they believed in vain. Verse 3. I love it. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also what? You see there? He got it first before he delivered it. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And a lot of people will get to that verse and they'll just say he died. I remember uh, Talmadge, I was reading his sermons, and he was one of those that uh, uh, said it was the death of Christ and not the blood. And Talmadge is a great orator, great preacher. I've got a lot of his good stuff. But when he said that, it reminded me of MacArthur, way John MacArthur, way back. So he says, oh, but he's got all sorts of neat stuff. But he did say that, and he did believe that, because he's messed around in that Greek and that Hebrew, and he got something out of there that, that he missed. And what he missed was, don't you, don't you like that where it says this? It says, where Christ died for our sins according to what? So what would you do? Wouldn't you read the scriptures to see how he died? Amen. So how did he die, people? He was scourged. It was a bloody mess. And next thing you know, you connect those verses with the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world, and you go back in the Old Testament, and you know what was real important? It was the shedding of blood. Was not. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So when you remove the blood from just the death, you got a problem. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Colossians, by his blood. You see? So when I'm looking at this, little words like that are important to me. And then verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to what? The scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, I like this. And after that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And I look at this, I'm saying, my goodness, what evidence we have there, huh? Yeah. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And look at verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also. As one born out of due time. Wow, Paul, yeah. Only those that have been saved can give the information out with power. I mean, you can't tell somebody with power if you don't have it, right? You can't, and that's why it's so important for Christians not to doubt. Because when you become double minded on that thing, you have. You don't have much confidence to tell somebody else about how good God is and how he saves you, and you can know it, right? You can't do it. I couldn't do it when I was going through stuff. It's amazing. I could preach, but I couldn't. 
the one-on-one -on -one thing was like stymied until I went in that basement and, and God had to show me all the stuff the devil made me forget. Because that's the devil's job is to deceive you. Right? Show you how unworthy you are in the flesh. And it's your job to admit how wicked your flesh is. But you're saved not because of what you did in your flesh, but because of what Christ did for you. How do I know that? According to the scriptures. Amen. So you see, by me believing the scriptures and forgetting about my emotion, that's real faith. I'm believing what God said, not by God giving me feelings. Can you get that? Okay, I'm trying to help you this morning a little bit. So Paul willingly gives his testimony free of charge, and all those obedient to Christ uh, command in the, in the Bible uh, did likewise. When you, when you read the Bible and you find out about all those uh, Peter, Paul, James, and all those people that were obedient to Christ's command, what's that? Uh, to deliver uh, what they received to the lost, the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. And uh, I'm an ambassador of Christ to deliver the message that people can be reconciled, which is my job. I can deliver that if I willingly give what I have already received. And uh, it's an amazing thing. So in your decision, in your decision making every day, uh, do you choose other things over sharing the gospel? Have you ever shared your testimony with others? Uh, if you could say no to this, then that means by deduction that everything else is more important. You exercise your will to do contrary to the will of God. What are you saying? Because I'm saying if you have a testimony, if you got saved, why would you tell somebody about it? And we know there's appropriate time. If you're working on the line, if you're working a job, you know there's certain times, break area time, there's certain times you do that because you don't want to rob from your master that uh, is paying you. But I mean, it's your life as a Christian. Second importance is separation. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we can... Uh, go up and down and around this stuff all the time, but it's very important. You'll find out about that. I have. It, it really wears on you. Uh, this doctrine right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 14 through 18, and I would suggest all you uh, members of Victory Baptist just to read those verses over and over again. If you want, get 1828. If you don't want, just do scripture with scripture. Just on your own study. Just on your own study. The Bible says this, Be not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. That's what it says. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with what? Darkness. Now, you're a pretty intelligent crowd. What, what do you think that's talking about? Well, preacher, i got to work. It says fellowship. It means that you're in the same boat going in the same direction with somebody. It means you're hanging around. Right? It means don't do it. You may have to work. You may be in the military have to fight with them. Fellowship is a heart-knit thing. You see? Yeah, but I get more more loving and graciousness from these lost people than I do saved people. Pray about that. Pray about that. It'd be something if you were a missionary and you're the only person there you could fellowship with, wouldn't it? And you go out there and nobody got saved for three or four years. Hmm. I mean, how could you maintain your sanity? How could you maintain light in a dark world? How could you not be in a creature designed to fellowship with other human beings? How could you not go over there and just smoke the peace pipe and, and boogie with the witch doctor and, and, you know, I mean, you know, dress naked like all the natives over there, you know, I mean, I mean, how could you, I mean, they'd be looking at you weird. You know, some missionaries go over there for years. And then all of a sudden you get a letter. One got saved. Now I got somebody to really fellowship with. Another one gets saved. 
But you see, if they left during that time, or if they fell during that time, there wouldn't be a work there. We're called, all of us, to the mission field. You can believe this if you, if, if, if you want, but we're all called here by the very fact that God said, go and tell. Right? So, I mean, we've got our responsibility here as ambassadors. So I read on, it says, verse 14, I mean, verse 15 now. And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, I think about those verses. Being forced to do something is really for children. I mean, it's laborious, it's painful, and it's embarrassing. It's the most embarrassing time of the life of that child. It should be. Because as that child gets a little older and they're forced to do certain things in conformity of their parents' rules and regulations, when they start to mature a little bit more, it gets more embarrassing. It gets more noticeable to others that they're different. And that child can resent it all they want. But that parent is in control of that child. That parent is trying to protect that child. That parent is trying to teach that child that the child is going to grow up one day and be different than everybody else. Not equal, but different. Amen. Because there's no way darkness can accept your light unless you are light. Darkness will not accept it. Darkness will be repelled. But that's our call in life. So you see, if the child doesn't learn that from the parent, then when they get older, it won't be rough sailing. Because they won't be used to being separated to begin with. You see? Well, that's psychological. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. That's why when those kids get saved, they ought to understand that. But that's another, another sermon. So when we can actually reason out, this is the key thing right here. Some, some it takes 30, 40 years, I guess. I don't know. But when that child is forced to do something, I use the word forced, probably because people don't like that word. I use punishment because people don't like that word. Probably if I go to court of law, I have to refrain from that or just let my lawyer talk with the new jargon that they have. Amen. And uh, because those words do have definitions, and I can find those definitions of those words with scourging and, ch and chastisement in my Bible. Same definition. I can go to Proverbs and find the same definitions for those words within Scripture. Remember? The blueness of the womb. Spare not for their what? Crying? What would you call that? Cruelty! Anyway. When we can actually understand and we can reason out the protective quality of separation and decide on our own God's warnings are for our peace of mind our love, not fear for God, becomes our willingness to give. See, your will will start to change and you start understanding, I am not a drug addict. I am not an alcoholic. I do not have AIDS. I am not hooked on pornography. I am not hooked on this and that. And you can trace back to those times when somebody tried to separate you and keep you from something that you thought was so important because the world was doing it, when you finally got a hold of that, you said, my goodness, and you look at all of them out there and the direction they're going and the fruit of their life, you say, thank God, love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Forgive me, parents that care. Many Christians are in jail. Many Christians, are, we see them in a mission, in the gutter. Because of addictions, because they wouldn't listen. See? Yeah. You can have music after that one. 
So there's a reason God put this stuff in the Bible. If I violate it, I reap. You're going to reap too. So if you think about that, when you think back and you think, God, it's like now. You have adults that were backslidden for years. Uh, they get right with God. They look back over their life. What can you do? you got to love God. Why would you be mad at God? Amen. Think about that. I mean, He could have killed you any of those times. Think about the stuff that you could have succumbed to. And He gives you victory. And He protects.
We've been seeing none of that. We've been seeing the set mentally to what somebody says up there, but nothing in the heart. It's with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So when they ascent, when they consent in their brain, their intellectual uh, being, they assume because they said something. And they said they're saved, and they wrote their name on a little card that they are. But see, salvation comes, when the law comes, you die. In other words, it's a school teacher, the Bible says, on the salvation. In other words, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. So all these people that are chewing bubble gum and think it's flippantly, and they, they just say whatever somebody says, and there's no conviction. You're going to have no conversion. You're going to have a whole lot of people having the right words because everybody's teaching them all the words, but there ain't nothing in their hearts, and therefore there's no action outside. Period. That's dangerous, wouldn't you say? I would say. See, no separation brings in a whole nother perspective into your Christianity that's not Christian at all. It's religious. Bible Christianity teaches you from Old Testament all the way through that God demands his kids to be separate because you're different. That's why you're his kids. If you weren't different, then he'd be the, the father of the world like they profess he is. We're all children of God. Then you tell them about Jesus, right? He says, ye are, of the, ye are what? Of your father the devil. And the deeds you'll do. You know. And you're giving them verses, then all of a sudden they change. They change because they got no truth in them. Just putting this out there to you to help you along the way because you're going to notice that the things that will with your soul slow you down serving God. So if you keep adding more stuff to war with your soul, you're going to be doing battle with that all the time. You're going to get a martyr complex. You're going to think, well, I must really be serving God because i got all these problems. No, you got all these problems because you willingly want them. And you know they're wrong. And to know do good, do it not to him, they are sin. They're sin. That speech thing, that's something. I remember doing that at work. I remember, you know, throwing little things out there, you know. And, uh, And I was still cool. Mm. Just remember, we may not think it's as bad as the world, but we use similar words as them. At the same time, they would when they curse. So you got to watch that. Like Peter warming his hands at the fire of the lost, we try to show the world Jesus Christ is cool. Just look at us. Fit in. Our willingness to give is given to the conformity to this present evil world, not to the one who saved us. Demas in the Bible. Demas. Good old Demas in the Bible. He started off well, but he finished loving the world more than God. Now your will can be affected can really be affected by too much world. you got to think back how innocently you served God, told Him you were sorry when you messed up, read your Bible more than once in a day, and you talked to God all the time. I mean, you were grateful for your salvation. And now listen. Listen to yourself talk. Look in the mirror. And ask yourself if you're dressing for God or not. It's simple, right? Holy Ghost will talk to you. I mean, my goodness, the music. What about the music you're listening to? Where is true worship? Holy, sweet, comforting spirit. The thoughts elevated uh, to the holiness of your Father. I mean, we got to wake up. Sometimes you just got to wake up. You will. Your own will can be affected, astray. Then separate from the will of your Heavenly Father. It always takes the strain first. Being unthankful is the beginning to a failed Christian life. The downward trend is illustrated 
by a snowball rolling down the hill. It gets more mass as it gains in speed to its destiny. And where does it end up? At the bottom. Unthankfulness is like a giant magnet attracting every evil, defiling thing. People have been saved at their local church, helped at their local church, blessed at their local church, then something happens. They begin to criticize, find fault, become bitter, and leave. I mean, their will was affected by what? An unthankful heart. Unthankful heart. An unthankful heart is an unteachable heart, a selfish heart, a cold heart. They willingly give to anything that will benefit them. If they don't receive anything back, that's money or things or compliments, I mean, they just stop giving. This is not Christianity. Listen, our Lord and Savior gave up his will. His will? Yeah. For the will of who? The will of his Father. I mean, he gave up his own will for the will of the Father to come to earth, according to John 3.16, and to take our wrath. That's pretty heavy duty. Go to Luke 22. The devil will get us thinking how bad we are and all the areas that we're in. We'll try to change all the areas at once. Believe me, you can't do it. I mean, God can do it if he wills it. We have to work on one area at a time in our life that we know we can do in the sense of exercising our will. In Luke 22, and uh, two good verses here, verse 41 and 42 says this about our Lord. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, did he go to the cross? Is that what really bothered him? Or was it him defiling his body with all of our sins? A holy God. Well, he went to the cross, and he took all of our sins on himself. So apparently he gave up his will to do the will of the Father. So please, we got to get over ourselves. We got to be willing to give ourselves to separation. Give all your body, soul, and spirit to what's right, not wrong. Light, not darkness. Bible, not emotion. Be separate. That's what it says. Then lastly, willingly give yourself to service. God gave us salvation. We willingly give his plan to others. God uh, gave us his holy Bible to know what he likes and dislikes so we can be separated. But God wants to work through us. I mean, his good pleasure, you know. We must be a servant to others as Jesus Christ was. We must willingly give our heart to God on a daily basis for our service to be accepted in the beloved. I mean, where is your heart? We know that where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. We know that from Scripture. Now, this world is temporal. This world will burn up. Our home, family, and treasure is eternal. When I talk about family, that's all those that are saved is our family. Up yonder forever. Go to Titus and I'll close with this last verse of service. Titus chapter 2. Simple message this morning. Really. So elementary. It's the elementary stuff that gets us. We forget over years what was important. Famous verses here. Chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that, so we see that this is the grace of God that's going to teach us something, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, these are things that affect our outside man, right? Lust of the flesh. We should live soberly. There goes your social drink and drinking. Anything in there that would be abnormal, that would change your 
thinking, righteously, doing right, and godly in the present, in this present what? World. Not in heaven, but down here. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a what? Peculiar people. Look the word up, peculiar. Zealous of good works. These things, he's telling his preacher boys, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise them. In other words, don't stop preaching this message. It's important. Whether they listen or not, don't stop preaching the message. You're supposed to be peculiar. You're supposed to be weird to the world. You're supposed to be different. I mean, if you went in any other country, you'd definitely be different. It's just our country started a little different. We've had more of a Christian culture, dress codes. We had more uh, restrictions on immorality. And uh, we're used to that. And now it's all changing. All changing. It always does when you get more gods, more religions in a civilization that are being emphasized or made equal with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God doesn't like that. Just like he doesn't like his kids changing to them. He always warned Israel, don't be like Egypt. Peculiar. Different. Zealous of good works. Amen? So know you're saved. Understand that separation is important to you as a Christian. Because it's going to have a lot to do with how long you're going to stay in this thing. How long you're going to fight. How long you're going to think it's important to fight. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Some people have been so far away from the peace of God for so many years. They can't remember how good it was to have the peace of God. Listen, the peace of God is real. You just got to keep it. How do you keep the peace of God? Man, keep your accounts real short. When God speaks to you, answer. If you offend Him, say you're sorry. And go on with your life. But remember, your kids are important. Mom and Daddy don't stay in the race. The kids are going to think it's hypocrisy. Very important. Remember, we preach the rule. There's lots of exceptions. You're looking at one right here. I don't preach exceptions because we don't know how the mercy and grace of God is going to work on him. But he knows who you are. Amen? So just keep these things in mind. Simple morning message. Let's all stand bow our heads and uh, go Lord in prayer. You know where you are. It's summertime and uh, living is easy. <laughs> it's so easy to get complacent in summertime. It's so easy to be laid back. It's so easy to, that the enemy can creep right in on you. Understand this. You have the power to walk the Christian life. You have the power to do what is necessary in your life. You have the love of the Father. There's no greater love than His love. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He hears you. He knows your heart. He knows everything about you. Sometimes you just tell Him you love Him. You're going to trust Him, no matter what. He's given all He could for us. He's here now. He's here right now. You're saved. You brought Him in. When you leave, you're going to leave with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. What a blessing that God's Holy Spirit is in us. 
what a blessing. Father, we love you today. We, Father, appreciate all that you've done for us. And God, we need more, more faith to really believe greater. Father, what you've really done for us. We need you to open up our eyes to illuminate those things again, to show us how we need to stand firm, how we need to protect ourselves, because that's all standards do is protect the outside. Pray, dear God, that you give us a holiness on the inside to recognize things. Pray that you be with each and every one that's here today, that you give them traveling mercies home, Father, that you get them all back tonight peacefully, be with those that are away. We'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for what you're going to do in Jesus.